Okay. So we had left off. We're going to do this right this time. Right? Where we have double bond, HBr, hydrogen peroxide, and light. And that's going to make the least substituted bromine. Right. And we had started going through all the steps of a radical halogenation. Right. So there were three, initiation, propagation, and termination. Right. And so we had started with, as you would do, initiation. Right, where you take your hydrogen peroxide and you shine light on it. And that breaks. You're a new one. We got a new person. Zoom, someone left you. How does it feel? All right. So you make two. You make two hydroxyl radicals. And then that hydroxyl radical reacts with HBr. And it basically grabs the hydrogen electrons from the hydrogen bond, bromine bond come over. Because it takes two bonds to make, sorry, it takes two electrons to make a bond. To get one electron from the hydroxyl radical, one from the hydrogen bromine bond, and the other goes over to the bromine, and you generate water plus a bromine radical. Right, so the whole point of initiation is to make this radical. This is the radical that actually interacts with our double bond. Right, so once we have that, we can do propagation using that bromine radical. So we have our double bond, we have our bromine radical. Now our bromine radical will react with the pi bond, bring electrons like that. So you're going to break your carbon-carbon double bond. One electron is going to go pair up with the electron from the bromine radical, and the other electron is going to go on to the carbon. So that's going to give you a carbon radical. Right, so you're going to do a step, regenerate a radical. Now this is going to react with HBr. Same thing, it's going to attack the hydrogen. You're going to break the hydrogen bromine bond to put a hydrogen on your molecule plus generate bromine radical again. So then this bromine radical can um, go react with the next alchemy. Right, so it's just, so I'd make this bromine radical and I can restart this propagation step again. It goes to mark reacts with the next double bond and goes through this again. And so this keeps repeating over and over and over and over and over again, basically until you run out of double bond, right? Because as soon as you make the first product, you regenerate the reagent you need to do the first step over again. And that just keeps going, right? And you'll notice that when you have your bromine react with your double bond, you always want to make the most substituted radical, right? So this is the most substituted radical, right? Which means it's the most stable radical. Now, the last step is termination. And this is where you can take any two radicals that you have put, that you've generated in your reaction and just have them run into each other. So, You could have this carbon radical and this bromine radical 
react with one another. You're going to make a compound, but you're not going to make another radical, right? You're going to terminate the radical chain. So you can just pick any two radicals you have basically in your propagation step and just run them into each other. Now, this doesn't happen very often because radicals are very reactive. So the chances that you can have two radicals not find anything else to react with and run into each other is pretty low. But it does happen from time to time. And that ends our radical reaction. Since we're in Myrtle Beach, I'd make it akin to like, if you went to the driving range with your friend and said, we're not gonna leave until we both hit a drive and the balls hit in midair, right? You can do it, but you're gonna be there all day. Like pack a lunch, like you're not going anywhere, right? That's the same thing here. The odds of that ha the odds of two radicals running into each other is pretty low, but we generate enough radicals during this reaction that every so often it does happen. So when you have HBr, H2O2, and light, you're always going to make the least substituted bromine. So you're always going to put the bromine on the less substituted carbon of your double bond. All right? Because the whole your whole goal is to make the most stable radical you can when you have your, your bromine add to your double bond. So you have this, where you add your bromine and you make the tertiary radical, versus this, where you make the secondary radical, right? And if given the choice, your molecule is going to make, going to follow the most stable path. So it's going to make the tertiary radical, again, more stable. Right, so when you add hydrogen peroxide and light, you're going to make the least substituted bromide. You're going to put the bromine on the less substituted carbon. Right, if you just add HBr, you're going to put your bromine, just like before, on the most substituted carbon. So adding the extra reagents changes your selectivity, right? Going through the radical puts the bromine on the least substituted carbon. No radical puts the bromine on the most substituted carbon. Seem good? Okay. There are two terms that come up in radical reactions that I just want to kind of introduce real quick in case you ever hear them. Be like, I know that, I'm smart, right? So compounds that help radicals form. Are radical... <laughs> Refill, which I can't. Or radical initiators. So there are certain compounds, kind of like hydrogen. I don't know what that letter is. Like a drunk F. So compounds that help radicals form are radical initiators. So something like hydrogen peroxide is something that we can use to initiate a radical to form. Right. And then compounds.
as is normal, I got asked uh, what a word was because my handwriting is trash. Which here? Stop. Radicals are radical inhibitors. So there will be times where in reactions you worry about the reaction forming radicals that you don't want it to form. So you'll rad add a radical inhibitor that these will, if any radicals are formed, they will react with them immediately and basically terminate any kind of radical reaction that will happen. So you have radical initiators, things that help radicals form, and then radical inhibitors, things that stop radicals from forming. But I just wanted to, so if you ever hear like, oh, it's a radical inhibitor. It, as soon as you make a radical, it reacts with it and kills it. So other than getting me sick, again, the baby was in rare form yesterday. And so at like 9.30, I just text my wife, baby is an asshole. And then I text her a picture at like 1.30 of him in my lap just screaming at me. And I'm like, why does baby hate me? She's like, oh, he doesn't hate you. And then I got on Google Maps and I Googled nearest fire stations. And I just sent her the results of that search. And she wrote, are you sending me a list of the fire stations implying that you were going to take our child and drop him off at a fire station? And I was just like, yes, that is my plan. He's just going to go to the fire station. It'll be fine. In retrospect, I missed the opportunity to like, send that within a picture of him in his car seat and then in his car and a video of us driving. Like I missed that whole like build up. I was like, damn. But like then I then I had to just be screamed at in a, in a smaller space. And I was like, mm -mm, no. Sorry. <laughs> he just get out of his way. Oh gosh, an angry baby, run away. Yeah, he was in rare form. I dropped off a daycare yesterday. They're like, how is he? I'm like, he's been in a mood. Just like, here you go. Good luck. He is angry. All right. So our next reaction is our or our hydrogenations. I had like cut out the uh, the the I taken a picture and I was gonna like put up the uh, the entire exchange, but then I was like, what well, does the map does kind of show where I live and. I don't need that in my life. I don't need anyone like hiding in my bushes. I gotta see Wakefield, you're going down. I don't need that in my life. All right. So hydrogenation, you add H2 across the double bond. Basically, you go from, you go alkene to alkane. So wherever there's a double bond, you're going to turn that double bond into a single bond. Now, you can't just take an alkene and just mix it with hydrogen gas. You've not made a reaction, you've made a bomb, right? You've got to add some sort of catalyst to make this reaction work. So we need to add a catalyst. Oops letters. I hear they're important. Right, you need to add some sort of catalyst to make this reaction happen. But if you add the catalyst, you're going to add a hydrogen to each side, and you're just going to get back to the alkane with no double bond. So the catalysts that get used kind of most frequently are just palladium metal, platinum metal, or nickel. So basically you can just take these metals and just mix them with hydrogen. And these metals are able to actually pull H2 apart. And like instead of having it be H2, you've got hydrogen, I'm the metal, hydrogen, and then that metal is able to take the two hydrogens that it's holding and just stick them onto a double bond. So the metal rips the hydrogens apart and then smashes them onto a double bond. The reagent or the catalyst that you'll see me use the most in class is I like to use PD slash C. So this is
This is short for palladium on carbon. So basically what you do is you take basically charcoal and you grind it up into a fine powder. And then you coat the outside of it with palladium. So this just gives you a matrix that you can weigh your palladium out on. So it'll be like 1% palladium on carbon because you, use, you need such a small amount of palladium for these reactions to happen. It'd be really hard to weigh out the like 0 0.001 milligrams that you would need. So instead we just kind of put it on a substrate. We put it on carbon. The problem is, is even though it is just like charcoal or carbon, is palladium on carbon, if it gets around air, it just catches on fire. So I've on more than one occasion just set my entire reaction on fire, said, like mix everything in and just little fire in my flask. I was like, well, I guess I don't get to do this reaction anymore. I burnt all my stuff up. Sad times. These are sin additions. which means the H's are gonna be added from the same side. So this matters if we're gonna actually make two stereocenters. So let's say we have a tetra-substituted double bond. We add H2, palladium on carbon. My hydrogens are gonna come from the same side. So in the end, Right. I can say my two methyl groups are on are both up because the two hydrogens I added are both back. Or the opposite, right? My two hydrogens could come from the top and push my two methyl groups back. Right. Again, we don't know absolute stereochemistry, we just know relative stereochemistry. We know that they're relatively on the same side. So now if you're not making two stereocenters, you don't really have to worry about them being sin. Right, so otherwise these are pretty simple. Right, you're just like, okay, cool, H2, palladium on carbon. Wherever the double bond was, it's not in the product. So, there you go, super straightforward. I was asked if I needed to show the hydrogens in the product or if they were just understood because I was using steel level structures. Yes. So by not showing the double bond, like it's understood that I added a hydrogen and a hydrogen to the product, right? I don't have to show it because it's scalable structures. So I can just draw it without the double bond and you know that the two hydrogens were added. So the more carbons you have on the double bond, oops, the harder it is to hydrogenate. So more substituted double bonds are more stable. So the more groups, the more carbons that are on the vinyl carbon, the harder it is for these for double bonds to be hydrogenated, for them to react in this reaction. So kind of our list of stabilities of double bonds is, so a double bond that has four groups on it is tetra substituted. This is gonna be most stable. Then you're gonna have tri substituted is next, then there are kind of two different versions of di-substituted. There's what's called 1-2, two, 
where the substituents are on opposite carbons. And then there's one, one. So this is one, two di sub. And this is one, one di sub. And then the least stable are just mono substituted, which we, of course, we ran out of space. Mono substituted, least stable. So tetra substituted are the most stable. They're the hardest to hydrogenate. Then tri substituted, then one, two di substituted, then one, one di substituted, then mono substituted, where you just have one group. These are the least stable or the fastest hydrogenate. So, so we can use this difference in reactivity to kind of, if we have more than one double bond, we can say like, oh, well, the mono substituted double, bond, substituted double bond is going to react faster than the tetra substituted double bond. So maybe I can hydrogenate that one before the other one. In practice, this is like really hard. So for us, if you see double bonds in your molecule that aren't part of an aromatic ring, you just are gonna remove all of them. So if you have a situation where let's say you have two double bonds and you have H2 palladium on carbon, you're just going to remove all your double bonds. Because it's pretty hard to differentiate them. And you know, it's science. So we like usually handle the H2 in the classiest way possible, which is you get a birthday balloon from Walmart and you fill it with hydrogen gas and you put that on your flask and you science it up. Do I have a bag of birthday balloons from Walmart in my lab? I do. I don't ever use hydrogen in my lab though. Usually it's nitrogen, which doesn't blow up, but yeah. Sorry, sorry. There is a chip out of one of my uh, uh, lab benches in my hood, in one of my hoods, because uh, for chem club, I was throwing sodium in a uh, container and it burnt through the side of the plastic container, got on the bench and then burnt a hole. In my in my lab bench, so I'm just like, oh, the building was like two weeks old. I had already ruined it. Yeah, it's like that's what you that's why you don't put hot things in plastic tubs. Check. All right, but if you have an aromatic ring, so you have a benzene, and then you have H2, palladium on carbon. So the double bonds in an aromatic ring don't react. They are way less reactive than all the other double bonds that we have. So if we do a hydrogenation, those double bonds will stay and only the double bonds outside of the ring will react. We'll go into why that is at the beginning of organic two, but for right now, they just aren't reactive. So I wanted to take a second to kind of review all of our additions, right? Organize them into the ones that are sin additions, where they're adding the things from the same side, and the ones that are anti-additions. Just like one big wrap-up for everyone, right? So for sin additions, we have hydroboration. Right? So hydroboration is oh, BH3. You're going to add your OH and your hydrogen from the same side, and then I'll push, in this case, our two methyl groups both down. Then what we just talked about, 
Hydrogenation is a sin addition. So again, we'll use my same, make it a little different. There you go. H2, palladium on carbon. Again, sin addition. These are going to come from, you're going to end up on the same side. Right, so. And then dihydroxylation is the other syn addition. Yes, sir. So I was asked why the hydrogenation worked in a ring when I had said earlier that they don't work in rings. Only if it is, so, only if it's aromatic. So there would have to be three double bonds in the ring. So they react with just one or two. When you get to the third one, they become way more stable. So one, two rings in, one or two double bonds in the ring, you're good. Third one, problemo. Dihydroxylation, remember there's two ways to do this. There's like osmium tetroxide and hydrogen peroxide. Your osmium holds onto the two oxygens and then sticks them onto the double bond from the same side. It gives you that. That sounds so healthy. All right. And then there is using cold dilute KMnO4. Right, or you can use cold dilute KMnO4. Same deal here, the manganese is holding onto the two oxygens and sticks them on from the same side. So we'll say, hey, oxygen up. Oxygen up, that's going to put this ethyl group back. So these are your three, four, if you break down the uh, dihydroxylations in the two things, right? But these are your, all of your things that go through syn addition. They're going to add your groups from the same side. The thing they all have in common is both groups that are added get added at the same time, right? They come together and they get dropped on the double bond from the same face. Right, our anti additions. So we're gonna put them on, we're gonna put our groups on the opposites on opposite sides. There's really only two that you have to worry about. Right, and there's that's halohydrin synthesis. Wait, see. No, nope. do it in the right order. Halogenation. There we go, sorry. I know, I know. His only job is to read the slides he made, and he can't even do that. I know, I know, right? You, here, you're going to add your groups to opposite sides. So halogenation, adding two halogens, they always end up on opposite sides. And then you have halohydration or halohydrin synthesis, right? Where you're gonna have Cl2 in water, let's say. You're gonna have halogen on one side, water on the other, or OH on the other, right? On the slides, oxymercuration is in here, but you usually lose you lose that stereochemistry when you add your hydrogen. So it doesn't show up, so we don't we're not gonna worry about it. Right? And the thing that these two reactions have in common, right, is you get you know a three-membered ring with a positively charged halide. And that halide blocks one face of the molecule. And then the other halide or the other nucleophile that then adds 
has to come from the opposite side. So if the halogen, if the halonium ion, the chloronium or bromonium, bromonium are up, then the nucleophile has to come from the from the bottom, has to come from behind. These are the only like five reactions that you need to worry about stereochemistry for. Right? If you're making two stereocenters when you do these reactions, you need to make sure that you show wedges and dashes on your product. If you're not making stereocenters, you don't have to worry about wedges and dashes. Seem good? Okay. And then the last thing is olefin metathesis. This is kind of an outlier in terms of the reactions we've been doing. Everything we've been doing, we've been adding something to a double bond, right? Breaking the pi bond and adding something. So my eighth grade, ninth grade history teacher to convince us, Mr. Shof, to convince us how, to remind us how to spell hypothesis. You stab your sister with a needle, hypo, the sis. So hy hy hypothesis is hypo, the sis. If you were to stab your sister with a hypodermic needle. So, no, so whenever I read met metathesis, I'm always like, meta the sis. I don't know what meta would mean. But that sounds bad, but I have how you met a, a sis, but there you go. So this is in my head. I'm like, ninth grade history, ninth grade science teacher, you made a difference in one person's life. His his big thing is he would wear a tie with like four or five different colors on it. And then you had to, based on his tie, figure out what color his socks were. Because his shirt would be one color that was in his tie. His pants would be another. And he had to figure out what color his socks were. That was his like, that was his that was his shtick, changing lives, teaching us how to color coordinate. All right. So with all of the metathesis, we're actually going to be able to put two double bonds together to make a bigger molecule. So you're able to take two double bonds and use a catalyst. And you're able to put them together and make a bigger molecule. So what I always say is that we take the two inside carbons of our double bond here and here, and we put them together here and here. Right? So we take the two N, the two insides and put them together and the two ends get stuck together and they make ethylene gas. So this is end carbon, end carbon. They get stuck together. So the catalyst that, get, that gets used the most is Grubs one or, oops, grubs two. Not that I'm in any way ever going to expect you to remember these as structures, right? But this, this is grubs one and grubs two. There's like four or five other catalysts that you can use to do this reaction depending on what you want to do. These are the catalysts. All you have to remember is if you see grubs one, the word grubs one, or the word grubs two, or word, right, that you're going to do an olefin metathesis. You're going to stick your, you're going to stick two double bonds together. But I'm never going to have you like need to know what these catalysts look like. Let's go back to our regularly scheduled programming of happy little whiteboard. All right, uh, hey buddy, welcome back. Okay. Um, so 
we can take two double bonds and stick them together. So we can do it just like I had before, where we have two terminal double bonds and a catalyst, say grubs one. For our purposes, grubs one and grubs two are 100% interchangeable. We don't live in the real world. We live in organic one. In the real world, they're not. But for us, it's all the same, right? So we're gonna take inside double bond of one, inside carbon of the double bond, bond it to the inside carbon of the other one, and we're gonna make a bigger compound. On an exam, this would be what I would care about, is this bigger product. The fact that you generate ethylene is cool and all, but we're not ripening bananas, so we don't care. You know, that's how they make bananas ripe, right? You know that? I was asked if you need to draw ethylene as a product. No, I don't care about this. This, this is a gas. It bubbles out of your flask. You don't have to show me that. You can just, this is business time. Yeah, so bananas come to grocery stores a lot of times just green. And if you like blow ethylene gas over them, they turn yellow. So they can like, that's how they can quickly ripen bananas. There you go. So we can also do this if we have a symmetrical double bond. So let's say we have a situation where we have this. We can take one side of our alkene, right? We're gonna break our, this alkene in half, and we're gonna use one side of it to react with the, the other double bond. As a general rule, when you do a metathesis reaction, you make trans double bonds. Right, so you're gonna always try to make your double bonds trans. Like, why does this flip over? Because I wanna draw it as, I wanna make a trans double bond. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter how I draw it, right? I could have drawn it just as easily like that, right? It's the same molecule, right? So it's just floating around in the flask. It doesn't matter how it's oriented. Yeah. But you always want to try to make a trans double bond because Grubbs metathesis wants to make the lowest energy, the most stable double bond it can. And a trans double bond is more stable than a cis double bond, right? Because the two groups are further away. All right, so I should probably write that somewhere. I feel like I've said this before, but we're in a video somewhere. Right. It's the minivan it's the minivan theory. Right? Which is your parents bought a minivan so they could put you in the put your little brother in the middle seat and they could put you in the back so you're far away. That's a trans double bond. We put the two groups super far away so they can't hit each other. We have peace in our time, right? If you have like a Honda Civic and you're both stuck in the back, it's just eight hours to grandma's house of, eh, he's touching me, right? That's high energy, that's awful, right? So sis, this, the groups are close together, they bang into each other, they complain, the double bond's like, I will turn this molecule around, right? And then when they're trans, got that sweet minivan, that third row of seats, you're like spread, spread apart. No one interacts with anyone. It's great. My parents had the like, the sedan where like when I was in my teens, I would like 
get my feet caught up under the under the front seat because I was too tall. And I was like, oh, curses. Right. And then there were three of us, so they were like all stuck. Oh, oh. Right. You can also use metathesis reactions to, to make rings. So if you have two double bonds in the same molecule, Right. You count inside carbon to inside carbon. So let's say this to this. One, two, three, four, five. So you're going to make a five-membered ring. You can only make five and six, you can make five and six membered rings easily with metathesis reactions. You make five and six membered rings easily. Smaller rings don't form, bigger rings take some work. Now, if you have something that is, right, if you have groups on your, on your chain between your double bonds, they're all gonna just show up in your product as well. So here I'm gonna make a six membered ring. And since you've numbered your carbons, you can say, okay, carbon three has a methoxy group. So carbon three in my product also needs to have a methoxy group. Carbon four is dimethyl. So carbon four needs to have a dimethyl. So all the groups in your starting material are gonna end up in your product. I was asked why I picked that direction the number and not the other direction the number. Oh, I'm not numbering in any way that has anything to do with naming. I'm just trying to count how many carbons are there are between from the inside carbon of one double bond to the inside carbon of the other, so I know how big of a ring I'm going to make. But like you could have started at the blue dot as one and gone red dot as six. It doesn't matter. You're just trying to like track how big the ring is going to be and where each group is going to be in the product. Yes, yeah, so the three and the four could be flipped. You, then you would just have to flip what group was on what carbon. Right, so if you did it like this, if it was one, two, three, four, five, six. You just have to make sure you have methoxy and dimethyl. So with that, we're gonna finish up. We'll do a few more metathesis examples on Friday. And we're gonna start on alkynes. And hopefully we get through alkyne naming so I can put that on the test. <laughs>